All right, welcome back. We're going to talk about electronegativity and polar covalent bonds today. Uh, a bond that's polar has two ends, a positive end and a negative end. Now, this definition of bonding is more accurate than the atom type definition of bonding, at least when it comes to describing how atoms uh, inside bonds behave and how the whole bond behaves. And this is also going to be a crucial idea when we get to uh, how molecular polarity occurs. So we need to recall, though, that electronegativity is the uh, description of how well an atom shares electrons when it's bonded to another atom. And the value uh, that happens to be larger is the one that's going to win the tug of war. So high values mean that they really like electrons, an atom really likes electrons. You're going to have a resource that looks like this. And for our resource, the electronegativity is in the bottom of the uh, periodic table square. You can see that up here. There's a key to tell you that. So we've already talked about it being a more complete definition of how a bond actually behaves. Uh, here are your steps. You're going to find the electronegativity difference, so subtract between the two atoms that are inside that bond. And when we're subtracting, um, we're always going to have our answer be positive, so be big minus small. Now, if your difference is greater than 1.7, it's going to be an ionic bond. If it falls 1.7 to 0 0.3, including 1.7 and 0 0.3, it's going to be a polar covalent bond. And then if it's uh, less than 0 0.3, this is a nonpolar covalent bond. It's a good time to mention right here that when we're talking about this definition of bonding. We're talking about something called bond character. And if you happen to be a bond that has an electronegativity difference greater than 1.7, that just means that most of your bond character is ionic. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some bond character that's polar covalent. The closer you get to, pol uh, to the 1.7, the more bond character you're going to have that's polar covalent. It's just that most of it's ionic. And then likewise, if you're 1.7 and you're polar covalent, um, that just means that the majority of your bond character is polar covalent, whereas there is still some bond character that's ionic. And as you get closer to 0 0.3, even though you're polar covalent, um, if you're 0 0.3, you have very little ionic character, but you're mostly polar covalent character. However, there is some non-polar covalent character. So this is bond character. It's not like once you hit that 1.7 threshold, all ionic character is gone. It's just that the majority of your character is polar covalent and some of your character is ionic. So um, we'll get to this here in a second, but what I'd first like to show you is how you'd solve one of these problems um, if you happen to have them on a worksheet. Here are three different examples of where we can use the electronegativity definition of bonding to determine uh, the bond character and what kind of bonds actually occur in between these two atoms. So here we have nitrogen stuck to oxygen, two copies of nitrogen. We're going to assume it's just nitrogen-oxygen bond. Uh, so then what you do is you look up the electronegativity values of each of these atoms. Nitrogen is 3.04. I'm just going to round that to the whole number, so 3, or to the tenth, so 3.0. And then for the oxygen, your table says 3.44. Now these are coming off of the resource table that you happen to have uh, provided to you. 3.44 rounds to 3.4. Then we're just going to do big minus small, so 3.4 minus 3.0 equals 0 0.4. And a 0 0.4 electronegativity difference falls within the polar covalent range. Next up we have potassium chloride. Uh, where we have potassium and chlorine, potassium's value is 0 0.82, which rounds to 0 0.8, and chlorine's value is 3.16, which rounds to 3.2. So we're going to do big minus small. Which has a difference of 2.4. This means that it's greater than 1.7. This is going to be an ionic bond. Finally, we have two copies of chlorine. So we're going to assume it's chlorine stuck to itself. Now, it doesn't really matter what the number is. It happens to be 3.2. But any number minus itself is going to be 0, which means that this is going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. Moving back to our presentation, can also draw something called a dipole moment. Di means two, pole means ends. 
So in a bond that happens to be polar covalent, this only works for polar covalent, we can draw a dipole moment. A dipole moment is showing that there's a slight positive end and a slight negative end on a bond. When we do that, the slight negative end is going to be on the more electronegative atom, the one that had the larger electronegativity value. That end is going to get the arrow, whereas the positive end, the smaller electronegativity value, value is going to get a positive sign. This is the dipole moment, and what it does is it shows where the electrons flow inside that bond. We could draw one of those on one of our previous problems like this. We only had one polar covalent bond in our previous example problems, and that would be the N2O. Now, the oxygen is more negative, so I'm going to put a negative sign above the oxygen. The nitrogen is more positive, so I'm going to put the positive sign above the nitrogen. Now, on an arrow that you'd shoot, this is like the feathers. This is like the broadhead. And what this is showing is that the electrons are flowing from the nitrogen over to the oxygen, and this is where the electrons spend more of their time. This is the partial negative end, partial positive end. After watching this video, you should have learned about the electronegativity definition of bonding and the values that cause a polar, nonpolar covalent, or a ionic bond. You should have also refreshed your idea of what electronegativity is, and you should know how to draw a dipole moment. Hope that helps.